Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my channel, Kalanadi. Today I'm going to wrap up all the things I read in December. I'm going to be rather brief about many of them because I don't want this to be another humongous video. I've been doing a lot of really long videos recently. Um, but I didn't do my normal weekly wrap-ups in December. It was not the most easy of months. Um, so I want to get caught up and then get back in the groove with my normal video schedule, which hasn't really been my normal for quite a while, but I'm trying. I'm trying in 2018, you know? So without any further ado, let's get into it. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is actually a book I finished in November and have not found a good place to talk about it in any video since. And that is a true novel by Minai Mizumura, translated from Japanese by Juliet Winters Carpenter. I came to this book purely because I wanted to read one of Mizumura's novels after I read her nonfiction book, The Fall of Language in the Age of English, which was actually one of my favorite books of the year. I didn't have much choice because only two of her novels have been translated so far, so I chose uh, a true novel because the short description that it's like a retelling of Wuthering Heights in post-war Japan really intrigued me. This is a true story related to Mizumura about a man that she had met as a kid uh, that she decided to write as if it were a novel. And the true story just happens to really resemble Wuthering Heights. I loved this story. And even though I read it over about a two, three month period, because I was trying to get the various parts of it from Interlibrary Loan, it haunted me the entire time. I still think about it a couple of months later, like, that was such a great story and how how true it is, how fictionalized it is, just makes me think even further about it. So this goes on that growing list of things that I would never have picked up for myself except I was pushing myself to read translated work and it turned out to be something I really enjoyed. And I would say if you want to read it, don't be put off by the page length. It is an incredibly fast read if you're enjoying it. And Mizumura's style is very basic, is probably misleading, but it's simple and lucid and just draws you in. And I, I just, I inhaled the book, you know? Then I continued my reread of the Tiffany Aching series by Terry Pratchett by listening to the audiobooks of Winter Smith and I Shall Wear Midnight. I'm not going to talk too much about these because I've talked about the first two when I reread them and it's pretty much more of the same. I really loved Winter Smith and I was most surprised by I Shall Wear Midnight because I didn't have any memories of this book. I vividly remember scenes and characters and such from the first three books, but I'm a complete blank when it comes to I Shall Wear Midnight. So I know I read it, I just didn't remember anything of it. Um, so at this point, I Shall Wear Midnight is my least favorite in the series, and I'm not sure if it's because it's missing a magic ingredient that the other four books have, or if it's just because it wasn't as nostalgia-fueled for me as the other rereads were, because I didn't have any memories of it. It's still good, it's just not the same as the others for me. Then I read No Time to Spare by Ursula Le Guin, which is her latest collection. It's actually a collection of her blog posts, and that's quite unlike any of the other collections I've read by her before, which were much more formal essays or commissioned speeches and stuff like that. This collection is also not really about writing or genre, fantasy, storytelling, stuff like that. It's more about everyday life, um, including aging and politics and the adventures of her cat. Very much blog material, you know. I thought it was good, but nowhere near um, as, as great as some of her other collections and reviews and essays have been for me. Probably because they are blog posts, they're not necessarily as hard hitting, but man, Le Guin manages to be this eloquent even on an average day, and I will never manage that. <laughs> The Race by Nina Allen. This one did not turn out to be quite the way I expected. Whenever people talk about this book, they always mention the Greyhound Racing. Only the Greyhound Racing is just an element of the first fourth of the book and it never reappears. So this 
kind of science fictional book is in four parts. The first and last stories are basically fiction stories that a character from the two middle parts has written. I read the first part and I read the second part and was like, this book is repeating itself because this woman with a different name sounds like she's living the same life as the woman in the first story, but it turns out that this author has basically written stories that she incorporates real aspects of her life, including her relationship with her brother into. So once I figured out how the book was structured, I, it just snapped into place for me. What I liked the most about this though was just the writing. Alan's style just draws me in. I never want to stop reading. I read her stuff so quickly. There's something about almost like these gentle dystopias that she seems to reuse in her work because I've also read a couple of her short stories and they very much resemble this um, like post-war, post-nuclear war, post-disaster wasteland in Great Britain or something. Um, I don't know if any of these stories are necessarily linked but there's this feel that is captured by each of them that I recognize each time and I really like that. So I'm not sure how much it's worth talking about the individual parts of this and what's in them, just that it's essentially a woman writing about her life in her fiction and a lot of it is about her very difficult relationship with her brother who might be a murderer and she doesn't know if he's he is or not. And there is Greyhound Racing which was one of the most interesting elements of the whole thing so I see why people keep mentioning it. Absolution Gap by Alistair Reynolds. This is the final book in the Revelation Space Trilogy and I listened to it on audiobook like I did the first two. I really didn't enjoy this as a conclusion. At this point all of my favorite characters were already dead or they die in the book in completely meaningless and ways that are kind of horrible for the sake of just being horrible. There are also new characters and the whole book is pretty much side stories for other people that will eventually come together again, which is kind of the structure of all the books in the series. Except I didn't like any of the new characters. I didn't care about their stories. I was particularly bored by the Quaish Rajmika storyline. My problem with this book overall, which is the things I didn't personally get or like, was it's come so far away from the original premise of the series, which is humanity's trying to escape civilization killing alien machines. Except that that thing, the thing hanging over everybody's heads, which is supposed to be motivating them, doesn't feel like it's even mentioned for hundreds of pages in this book. So, eh. I did not get what I wanted from it. Then there's another book that I did not like very much and that is Artemis by Andy Weir. What did I say in my Goodreads review of this? This book is average in every possible way and I hated the main character. It's supposed to be like a heist on the moon. The main character, this woman named Jazz, smuggles things in the city of Artemis on the moon and she's asked by like this billionaire dude to commit corporate sabotage so he can muscle in and take over the primary industry on the moon. And of course she agrees without asking any intelligent questions about this and it goes very wrong. Every decision that this woman makes ends up terribly and she never actually suffers many consequences because of it. I just can't. I hated this woman. I almost DNF'd this book multiple times because I disliked her so much. I wouldn't want to know this woman. I wouldn't want her within a thousand miles of me because she's the type of person who will quite literally decide to do something she thinks is smart and then end up almost killing an entire city by accident. No. What I objected to the most is at the end of this, it really felt like we're supposed to root for this woman because she's trying to buy back forgiveness from her father for something she did as a teenager. I think it's really, really misguided and offensive to try to repair your relationships and friendships with money. I am not going to root for this at all. <laughs> Just no. The Glass Town Game by Catherine M. Valente. This was a really lovely read that I think failed to deliver on action or story. So this is about the Bronte children, uh, Charlotte, Emily, Anne, and Branwell, who go on a magical adventure to Glass Town, which is a fantasy world that they'd actually created. And the imagination, the whimsy, the descriptions 
all of those things were completely on point. It's pure Valente right there. Very beautiful to read. But there's not much that actually happens other than these children wandering through the scenery and ooing and aahing and realizing which details they had created and had come to life. There really wasn't a quest. There wasn't much that they had to do in the world. They get split up and then they have to find each other again and then they go home. I think there needed to be more action, more of a point to what they were doing in the world, especially because this book was quite long. It was over 500 pages long and it's a children's book. And I think there's, there's actually some disconnect between the way that it's written and the audience it's targeted at. There are so many references to the Brontes actual works, which I think would go just fly over children's heads. And there's something about the use of language in this that I thought would have been particularly challenging for children. Like, I'm reading this as an adult and even I was trying to figure out some of the wordplay and stuff. So it felt like a very adult type idea packaged as a middle grade novel. That didn't work so well. Then I reread the first three books in the Darkest Rising sequence by Susan Cooper. These are Over Sea, Under Stone, The Darkest Rising, and Green Witch. I think I'll talk about this whole sequence uh, more when I'm done rereading the last two books. Um, I'll probably just rank these here. Over Sea, Under Stone, I remember adoring as a kid, but I read it during my boxcar children Nancy Drew mystery phase, and Over Sea, Under Stone is very much uh, a group of children following clues to find treasure. It's, it's like a detective story in some way. So I can see why I really loved it at the time that I read it. Now I think it's a little bit average, uh, probably my least favorite out of the entire series, and the one that doesn't seem to have aged as well. It was written in the 1960s, and there are some comments and things that the kids say and do that are very much of the time and wouldn't go over so well today. The Dark is Rising was actually my third or fourth reread of the book, and it is so far my favorite, just a real high point in the series, and probably the one that I would recommend people read. In fact, I think it might even be the most popular of all the books, even though it's number two, it is actually pretty great as just a standalone. Green Witch is the one that's really improved upon rereading for me. I don't know why, but I was really kind of creeped out or scared by this book when I read it as a kid probably because the Green Witch itself is a little bit scary. I think that's what bothered me before. But now I really liked it more, and I really liked that Jane has a more prominent role in it. Of all the kids in this story so far, Jane is the only girl, and so it's nice to see her having a bit more of an active role. The Prisoner of Limnos by Lois McMaster Bujold. This is the latest chronologically in the Penric and Desdemona series, which is set in the world of the five gods. I really enjoyed it. Can't describe the plot because it would massively spoil a couple of the previous novellas, but we're inching towards the conclusion to, I don't know, the very slow moving romance and, and Penrick's love interest, and I enjoyed the heck out of it. In late December, I went on a novella binge and I read like three of them in a row. So I read Passing Strange by Ellen Clages, one of my anticipated novellas of the year that it took me like a year to finally get around to reading. It was so good. I thought this was perfect. Um, the writing, so good. The story, the characters, the pacing. This was just the perfect type of story for the novella length. I didn't want any less. I didn't want any more. It also gave me some warm fuzzies in some way. So this is set in 1940s San Francisco, and it's about a group of friends who are lesbians, all kind of looking out for each other, um, trying to live their lives to be themselves, but stay under the radar of the police and everything. Two of them fall in love and they need to escape and their friends are going to help them do that. This pact that all the friends have that they keep for decades just to ensure the happiness of some of them it was really, really wonderful. The other two novellas that I read were the fourth and fifth in Matt Wallace's Scene Du Jour series called Idle Ingredients and Greedy Pigs. This series is the adventures and terrible things that befall a catering company that serves the supernatural side of society. 
everything is always going wrong. <laughs> Not much else to say about these two because it is the middle of the series, but um, if you're looking for some supernatural action adventure and descriptions of food that will make you very hungry or make you want to vomit, um, I would recommend it. The first one is called Envy of Angels and it's a lot of fun. Then I read Air by Jeff Ryman, which is one of the Arthur C. Clarke Award winners, and I will be talking about that in more detail in my next batch wrap-up of Clarke Award winners, which will be pretty soon because I've already filmed it. Then I read Starlings by Joe Walton, which is her upcoming collection of short stories and poetry. I heard up and read the arc that I got from NetGalley because I thought it was coming out in January, but actually I think it's coming out in February. Not sure if I got that mixed up or if the date actually changed. This collection was okay. There were really just a couple of standout stories for me, and I had to agree with Walton herself that quite a few of the stories, the earlier ones she had written, weren't really stories or weren't really that original, but there are a couple of really good ones in there that are worth seeking out. I wrote further thoughts on this in a review that I posted on Goodreads, so I will link that down below. I finally, finally read Provenance by Anne Leckie. I think a lot of you were surprised that I didn't read it as soon as I got my hands on it back in September, but I purposely waited until I thought the mood was right, and that happened to be the end of December, and I'm glad I waited. Um, this book is nothing like the Imperial Ratch series. It's nothing like Ancillary Justice. Um, it's not set in the Ratch Empire, though it is mentioned. So basically, this is about a woman who breaks a man out of prison in order to like impress her mother and increase her standing in her family so that she might be chosen as the next head of the family. Only it does not go the way that she had planned. <laughs> The man that she breaks out says that he is not the person that she was looking for. The topic of provenance and of the vestiges I think could have been dealt with in much more depth. Perhaps this had been a more serious book, but actually I really enjoyed it for what it is, which is a pretty humorous adventure heist novel. I liked the way the main character was presented. She's not perfect and may actually be aiming for something that she doesn't really want and isn't best suited for or whatever. She's anxious, she's not very confident, and that came across very well. I think it's really relatable. It's nice to have a main character who isn't like super confident about everything. <laughs> Um, the character that I really wanted to know more about, though, was Palad, the man that she breaks out of prison. He was very twisty. I wanted to know his agenda. I wanted to know more about his story and just get more of him. Um, and that's what I, I missed the most in this, is just didn't really wrap up everything I wanted about his character. So very enjoyable, but please don't go into this book thinking that it's going to be like Ancillary Justice. It is not. It is this one-shot standalone comic heist, basically. And now I am all caught up, thank goodness. <laughs> if you have read any of these and you want to talk to me about them, please leave me a comment down below. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll be back pretty soon with my next video. And until then, bye.